Um, we've been in a series called The Seven, where we've been looking at the, uh, what history of the church calls the seven deadly sins. And there is not necessarily a verse where you're necessarily going to find the, the seven deadly sins listed out. Uh, but the early church leaders, the early church fathers, what they did is they, they said, hey, the, there are certain sins that we see are kind of at the root of all sin. Right, And so we can trace back, like, like this, this sin can be traced back to the sin of greed, or this sin can be traced back to the sin of lust, or, or anger, or all of these things. And, and basically at the root of almost every sin lives these seven sins, the seven sins. And uh, we've looked at, at lust, uh, we looked at anger, we looked at envy, and today uh, I want to talk about sloth. I was supposed to write uh, the sermon this week, but I decided I didn't want to, and so uh, we're going to invite... Pastor Levi out to just play the guitar a little bit. Uh, I'm just kidding. If you don't get that joke, I'm glad you're here. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> we see this word uh, sloth. Uh, the, the idea of sloth, we're like, what does God have against uh, Flash from Zootopia? I don't understand. This doesn't make sense. Uh, we see this word sloth, and actually in, in, the, in the, the translation, it's, it's better translated sluggard. Uh, this idea of, of sluggard, and it shows up 14 times in the Bible, and uh, each time that it shows up in the Bible, it is not referenced positively, right? Uh, we see it in Proverbs 6, starting verse 6, it says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider it way, its ways and be wise. It is no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food in harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? Will you get up and go from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands and rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Proverbs 26, verse 13, a sluggard says there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. As the door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard turn on its bed. A sluggard buries its hand in a dish, but he is too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. A sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven people who answer discreetly. Proverbs 21.5, the cravings of a sluggard will be the death of him because his hands refuse to work. So we see this idea of sloth or sluggard is never seen in a good light. But we have to sit here and we have to go, okay, with all of this being said, I think it's important that we're careful how we define this idea of sloth or sluggard because it might be easy to just kind of look at it and say, don't be lazy. Just, just don't be lazy. And, and, and if we simply stop there, I think we actually miss the, the more nefarious idea or intent behind the sin of sloth. See, many people want to attribute this idea of sloth to just the idea of laziness. And while it looks like laziness, yes, the true mark of sloth is not laziness. The true mark here that, that, that we're being warned about by the early church fathers, what they're saying is it's not laziness, it's apathy. It's indifference. It's an unwillingness to do what God has asked of us. So well, let's define it this way. To be sloth is to be indifferent, to be apathetic towards the things of God. To be sloth is to be indifferent or apathetic towards the things of God. And that church, listen to me here, is deadly. When the church is indifferent about the things of God, it is deadly to boil it down, sloth is to mean, to, sloth to mean laziness is missing the point. The sin of sloth is far more pervasive than that. And I have this fear. I have this fear in the church, and when I talk church, I talk big C church here, is that while we're focused on the big glaring sins, maybe, we're actually missing a more destructive sin, and that is sloth, indifference, apathy, a refusal to do what God has called his children to do. And what is that command? What is the, what is the command that he gives? In Mark 12, 30, this is the greatest command. It says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The opposite of sloth, the opposite of apathy or indifference is not working harder. The opposite of it is love. A love for God, a love for others drives us to not live slothful lives. And so here's what I want to do is uh, I'm actually just going to preach to myself and you guys just get to listen. 
Cool. I want, to, I want to look at the different ways that we see sloth manifest itself in the lives, in our lives, in the lives of the church, and, and, and I, want to, um, I want to call it out. And it's probably going to be a little uncomfortable. And if you're sitting here and you're feeling a little uncomfortable, welcome to the club. So the first one is this, physical sloth. This is the one where most often when we think of sloth, that we think of, we saw in Proverbs that, that I read earlier that God does not take kindly to the idea of laziness or an unwillingness to work. But why? Why? I think to answer this question, we have to go back to the, gen, the Genesis narrative, the creation narrative, where it says in Genesis 2, verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work and to take care of it. And you're going, okay, Tyler. What does that mean? I don't understand. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. But I want us to notice something. We need to see this. In the creation narrative here in Genesis 2, this command from God, hear me, was before the fall of mankind. What do I mean? Being hardworking. Completing tasks that God has given us, being, being diligent in our work, is not a result of sin. Do we, do we know that? Being hardworking, working for God, doing things for the glory of God is not a result of sin because the command to work, to take care of the things that God has given us, has been a command before Adam and Eve sinned, before the fall of mankind. And yet so often, so many of us, myself included at times, treat work as though it is the enemy. And if I can make an observation, I think that the problem actually is that we have a a, a poor relationship or an unhealthy view or, dare I say it, a sinful perspective on work. Now, it doesn't mean, and I'm not saying here like work just necessarily for money. Some people in here maybe are going like, what do you have against retirement? I'm not saying like for money or anything like that. What I'm saying is for the purpose and the calling that God has given us, the things that he has called us to as a church, as people, as parents, as grandparents, as people as a part of a church, as people as a part of a community, this calling to work and to, to do things for the glory of God is there. And yet, all too often we treat work like it is the enemy. I'm talking about finding purpose and meaning in our work. That is, that is a beautiful thing. And, and, and the drive that we are called to is to work hard. Now, again, like, I just want to say, why? Why? Why does it matter? Like, why, why is work not bad? Because here's the thing. When we work, when we work for the glory of God, when we work hard, it is worship. Many of us maybe come in here and you struggle with the music because you're like, I'm not really into like singing and all that kind of stuff, or it feels a little emotional and I'm, that makes me uncomfortable, all that kind of stuff. But what if I told you, what if I told you that you getting up, going to work, working hard, providing for your family was an act of worship? If you're in the trade, every time you swing that hammer for the glory of God, when you work hard and you put to work the things that, that God has d- done and called you to and you're working hard, what if that was actually the beat of that hammer was the beat of worship? You see how this perspective changes? And this includes, hear me please when I say this, this includes the quality of work that we do. Dorothy Sayers is a novelist, and she wrote about the, the, uh, an essay on the topic of work, and she says this, and I think Scripture encourages this and informs this, is that the only Christian work is good work well done. The only Christian work is good work well done, meaning that if we are followers of Jesus, we do not take shortcuts. We do not cut corners. We don't do shoddy work. Why? Because everything that we do, we see this in Scripture, everything that we do is worship to our Creator. And when we do that, when we, when we choose sloth in, our, in the physical aspect, we're actually insulting our Creator. Guys, I want to be, be the best youth pastor that I can be because God is good. Because, I, because of a love that I want, I want to drive for God, a love for God in, 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 in how I do my job, I want to worship God. I want to live for God. I want, I want to honor Him in the way that I live. I want my work to be worship. 
This is why sloth is dangerous. It's, it's the only Christian work is good work, good work. There should not be bad Christian work. Again, I, I said this earlier, Dorothy Sayers, a Christian novelist, she wrote this essay on the, the response to work and Christian's response to work. And I want to read it to you here. It says this, In nothing has the church so lost her hold on reality as in her failure to understand and respect the secular vocation. She has allowed work and religion to become separate de departments and then is astonished to find that as a result, the secular work of the world has turned purely selfish and to destructive ends and that the greater part of the world's intelligent workers have become irreligious or at least uninterested, apathetic, indifferent in religion. But is it astonishing? How can anyone remain interested in religion which seems to have no concern with nine-tenths of his life? The church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him to not be a drunk or disorderly in his leisure hours and then come to church on Sundays. What the church should be telling him is this, that your very first demand that his religion makes upon him is to make good tables. Church, by all means, and decent forms of amusement, current, certainly, but what use, what, what use is all that if the very center of his life and occupation, he is insulting God with bad carpentry? No crooked table legs or ill-fitting drawers ever, I dare say, came out of the carpenter's shop in Nazareth. Nor, if they did, would anyone believe that they were made by the same hand that made the heaven and earth. No piety in the worker will compensate for the work that is not true to itself. For any work that is untrue to its own technique is a living lie. Let the church remember this, that every maker and worker is called to serve God in his profession or trade, not outside it. The apostles complained rightly when they said it is not meet for them to leave the word of God to serve tables. Their vocation was to preach the word. But the person whose vacation, vocation is to prepare the meals beautifully might also in equal justice protest. It is not meet for us to leave the service of our tables to preach the word. The only Christian work is good work well done. Let the church see to it that the workers are Christian people and do their work well as to God, then all the work will be Christian work, whether it is church embroidery or sewage farming. If we claim Christ, guys, if we claim Jesus as our Savior, as our Lord, then everything we do is Christian work. Physical sloth. We doing all right? really quiet in here. Mental sloth is the next. We are called to love God with our strength. We're called to love God with, with our, 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 our work, our physical. But we're also called to love God with our mind. And I would actually argue that in America, our greater wrestling with sloth is not necessarily the physical one because we get this idea of knowing how to, to go really hard, being really busy, pushing ourselves really hard. But actually, how do, we, how do we fail to love God with our mind? Because I think here's the problem is we often get in trouble because we, we work really hard, right? But then what we want to do is we, we, we want to just numb ourselves, just numb our minds, come home and just shut it off. And we're called to love God with our minds, to saturate ourselves with the knowledge of God. And yet, all too often, we get caught up into this sentimental view of Christianity. And we ask, like, oh, do, does this song make me feel good? Does this, does this sermon inspire me? And we look around with this consumeristic mindset, and the church becomes this list of checklists of do's and don'ts and does this and does that. And the danger of sentimentalism, and I'm not saying that like, emotionalism is necessarily bad. We should, we should experience God. We need to experience God, experience the love of God moving in us. But we also are called to love God with our minds. Because what happens is if we, just, we focus just on the sentimentalism side of it, there's, there's no mental foundation for why we believe what we believe. We think that, oh, if, if this makes me feel good or if this inspires me, it must be Christian. It must be what God wants. But none of it is grounded in the truth of God's word. Why? Because we don't know God's word. 
We don't spend time getting to know the heart of the Father. We just simply seek after the spiritual high or the thing that makes me feel good. And here's why this is dangerous. We need to have the experience of God and the knowledge that he gives us to come together because if we don't, if everything is just based on our feelings and what makes me feel good or what inspires me is when the storms come, when the things hit the fan, we crumble. Because we have no foundation for why we believe what we believe, the character of God, who he is, what he says. It's just basically simped, set on feelings because we've been slothful with knowing God with our minds, loving God with our minds, not knowing. This is, this is me and God right now, right here. So just, just listen in. Making excuses around spending time in God's word, spending time praying, not knowing or reading our Bible is not just something that we should be saying, oh, well, I guess I'm just busy. I'm doing other things. Guys, it's sloth. It's indifference. It's apathy. It's sin. Lifeway Research says this, says this, America has a literacy problem. Almost 14% of the adult population cannot read, but illiteracy is not just a problem in the secular society. A far worse kind of illiteracy affects the church, biblical illiteracy. Only 20% of Americans say that they've read the entire Bible at least, at least once. And only 22% say that they systematically read through a section of the Bible a little each day. A third of Americans never read the Bible on their own. Guys, the lack of biblical reading has led to a lack of biblical doctrine. How do we know? How do we know what God wants of us? We, I think if I were to pull this room, if I were to walk around in this room and say, do you want to know the will of the Father? Do you want to know what God has for your life? Do you want to know what God wants of you? We would all say yes, and then we don't actually go to where he says what he wants for us. How do we know that God is love? How do we know that God calls us to love our enemies? How do we know these things if we're not in the book? but I'm busy. Proverbs 1, seven says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but the fool despises wisdom and instruction. God is calling his church out of apathy and into knowing him. Knowing Jesus, loving God with our minds. Loving, yes, working hard, glorifying God, honoring him with how we work, but also loving him with him with how we grow and learn and loving him with our minds. Spiritual sloth. The reason I think that sloth is considered a, a deadly sin is not just because of physical sloth or mental sloth, although the Bible speaks to that, but spiritual sloth. If, if, if the physical sloth kills the body, the mental sloth kills the mind, then the spiritual sloth kills the soul. Matthew, 20, or Matthew 16, 26, Jesus said, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? An apathetic soul, guys, is a starving soul starving for the things of God. And I think that it's actually Satan's greatest tool against the church is this apathetic church whose heart, soul, mind, and strength are indifferent towards the things of God. He uses distractions, mindless scrolling, the things that we say, oh, like, it's fine, it's fine, I, I, I've earned this. How do we know? How do we know we've reached this place of, of spiritual sloth? I was thinking about this and kind of struggling through like questions that we can think about. How do I know if, if it's me? I think we have to ask the question, when was the last time our soul jumped in response to the gospel of Jesus? 
when we heard that, that God created us to be with him and our sins separate us from God and sins cannot be made right by good deeds and so paying the price for our sin, Jesus came and he died the death that I deserved and everyone who puts their faith and trust in him will have life and life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. When is our soul stirred from the gospel or have we just reduced it down to that one time I prayed that prayer at camp when I was 10 years old? When's the last time our soul skipped in response to the gospel? When's the last time that I shared what God is doing in my life with someone? That which we love, we talk about. When has our heart stirred in worship? Or are we just going through the motions because that's just what you do? If you're struggling to answer that, if I'm struggling to answer that, might we be sleeping? Have we been lulled into an apathetic, slothful heart? But Tyler, I'm busy. I'm so busy. I have so many things, but, but brother, sister, listen, are we looking at, are we focused on the right things? There, we have so many diversions, we have so many distractions in life, so many things that demand our attention, and yet in reality it's just distracting us from what is good. I think oftentimes when, when Satan can't get us to sin, he gets us distracted from the best thing. He gets us distracted from the right thing. Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, he says, my purpose is to give you life and life to the full. Jesus is looking at us and saying, I'm giving you life. I want you to have life that is found in me in a relationship with me. This life is wrapped up and found in me. It's like Jesus is handing us something of great value. And Jesus actually in Matthew 25, he illustrates this in the story of the, the, the parable of the talents. This, he says this rich ruler is going off and he's about to leave. And so he calls his servants in and he looks at his servants and he says he gives them something based on the ability that, he, that, that God has given them. So he looks at one and he says, hey, I'm going to give you five bags of money. And so he takes the five bags of money and he goes out. He looks at another one and he says, I'm going to give you two bags of money. And he, he goes out. He looks at the one, another one and he says, I'm going to give you one bag of money. And he goes out. And so then the servants go out. The, the ruler goes on his, his journey, and when he comes back, he calls his servants back, and he says, okay, what, it, what, what, what have you done? And the first one who he's given five comes in, and he says, I've taken what you've given me. I've used it and built it. I've invested it for your kingdom. Here's 10 bags. And he looks, and he says, well done. The second one comes in with the two bags, and he says, what have you done? I've invested it. I've invested it into your kingdom. I've used it for your kingdom. Here, now, here's four bags. And he says, well done. And the third guy comes in and he says, I, I was scared for I know you're a harsh man. So I dug a hole and I buried the money. Here's your one bag. The man doesn't say, well done. He says, you wicked, lazy servant. God has given us life. Something of value that we could never imagine on our own. He's given it to us and he's saying, take it, invest it into my kingdom. Invest it for the glory of God. Use it so that, God, that, that, that we can be multiplied and advanced through the gospel, through loving people. Advance it and move it out. And so often we can sit here and go like, oh, why did that guy get five? Why did that get, guy get two? Why did I only get one? That's not the question that's being asked there. Is what are you going to do with the thing that God has given you? What are you going to do with the place that God has placed you? In your workplace, in your school, where you're at what what are you going to do with what God has given you out of a deep love for God do we do we work well in wherever God has placed us God has given us life he's given you and me he's given us purpose and a command to love and to make people know Jesus God and to love God with our hearts and our soul and our mind and our strength we're not just saved for good works but the by our, by our good works the Bible is clear though that we are called to more and it's not the sin of sloth it's a love of God a love of people so how do we fight sloth? 
How do we, how do we begin to fight against this, this spirit of sloth or the sin of sloth? You could be sitting here going like, man, Tyler just yelled at me for the last 20 minutes, and now I just got to get up and I got to do better. First off, I'm yelling at myself. You're just listening. How do we fight sloth? The opposite of sloth, guys, hear me, this is important, is not try harder. It's not Nike, just do it. That's not it. You can't. It is only by the Holy Spirit coming in and dwelling you and you falling into love with Jesus. The opposite of sloth and indifference and apathy is not trying harder, it's love. It's the love of God. As we seek Jesus, as we seek to know him, to spend time in his word, to spend time in prayer, to spend time worshiping him, to love him with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, what happens is it comes. So often we think like, oh, I became a Christian, so now I gotta feel this way, I gotta, I, I gotta do these things, and what happens is when the feelings aren't there and we don't do it, and we're like, man, is something wrong? Is something broken? Did I do something wrong? No, it's because even when we're not feeling it, we're responsible for the obedience, not the outcome. Even when I don't feel it, I'm going to go to my Bible and I'm going to know the heart of the Father. I'm going to learn the heart of the Father. Even when I don't feel it, I need to get on my knees and I need to spend time connecting with him in prayer, in worship. Am I doing the work when I walk into this room and not going, God, okay, just do whatever you want to, like, like you, you got to do it. No, am I going, God, prepare my heart. Ready me for what you have. God, did, would you use me in worship, even if I'm not doing anything up here? Am I walking in here going, God, God, prepare my heart, ready me. I want to love you with my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength. And when we delight ourselves in Jesus, when, when, when the feelings aren't there and we say, you know what, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to step out in obedience. Do you know what happens? The feelings come. It's wild. How many times do we come in and we go like, oh, I'm not really feeling worship, and then all of a sudden we're met by Jesus when we say, no, I'm just going gonna, I'm, I'm to lean in. I'm going to lean in. I'm going to reject apathy. I'm going to reject indifference. God, what do you have for me? I'm ready. Life. Life is too short to be indifferent. And church, that is not what God calls us to, to apathy and indifference. Ephesians 5, 8 through 17 says this, For you were once darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Live. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed in the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Verse 15, be very careful then how you live, not as the unwise, but as the wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. My heart has been heavy over the last couple weeks. Just, I read that and make, every, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. The days are short. And my heart longs for Jesus. Longs to be in the presence of God. Here on this earth, but if he decides that he wants to come back and take me, I'm cool with that too. But my heart has been longing for Jesus. I've, I've seen my apathy and I've seen my indifference in, in so many different areas. And I, I've had to confess this week and just go, like, this, is, this, this message was not an easy one. I hate when the Holy Spirit's like, hey, we're going to deal with your stuff and then you can talk. It's like, that sucks. That sucks. 
I don't know, well, I can't say that. <laughs> but my heart is, is so heavy and longs for Jesus. As I, I just think in the last two weeks, just been hit with this reality of death. Just, uh, just a couple days ago, my, uh, we had the funeral for my wife's grandpa, 94 years old, a life lived, a legacy of faithfulness to God, a life of prayer. And you see it in, in his kids as they talked about it, and you saw it. Was he a perfect man? No, he wasn't a perfect man, but he lived without an indifference. Life is too short. There's, there, there, there's so many things going on to just live a life of indifference. I've just been, been faced with the, the, the death of a family member. We had neighbors who I grew up with and grew up next to. They died in a, in a motorcycle accident. Right? A student of ours that's going to be going on the mission trip just uh, sent a, a prayer request out in our group chat and saying, hey, one of, my, one of my teammates on my baseball team drowned this week. Got word earlier this week that a former student of mine, 30 years old, died of a heart attack. It puts her in perspective this life. Church, I... I I don't think we can sleep anymore. I, don't, I think we need to wake up. I think, I think that, that Satan has lulled us to sleep with this apathy, especially in the American church, and this idea of like, it's fine, I, I'm just, getting, I'm just going to stay comfortable. What's it say? It says, this is when you go off script here. Proverbs 6, verse 9. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands and rest. That's not what we're called to. That's not what God has for us. Church, it's time to wake up. Our world, this world needs the church that is awake, that is connected in the presence of God, that loves God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. Church, no more sloth. And it's not shut up and do better. It's run to the arms of our Savior. Let his love permeate in us. You cannot operate out of an empty spirit. Let him fill your spirit. Let him overflow your cup. And out of that comes life. No more sloth. It's deadly. No more sloth. God, I confess my moments of apathy, my moments of indifference, moments where I, I just didn't feel like it. God, I want to pursue you. I want to pursue the heart of the Father. I want to pursue you with, with how, how hard I work for your glory, not for my own uh, establishment, my own riches, or my own life. I want to work to honor you because when people look at the, my life, I want them to see you. I want to love you with my mind. I want to know you. I want to seek you. I want to love you with my heart and my soul. I want my heart to break for the things that break your heart. I want my, my life to point to you. No more sloth, God. Resurrect our hearts, God. Wake us up. In Jesus' name, amen.